You need to ask yourself the question, and am I following Jesus in such a way that I can show real love about him to all peoples? That's a good question. All right, we pick up with number 14. If you're taking a note or two, if you'll do that, it'll be a blessing to you. Real love is sin-hating. Real love is sin-hating, or if you see on the screen, Matthew, Matthew. <laughs> That's real good. I was going to match, you know, and I got to Matthew. I'm thinking about the gospel of Matthew, maybe. Real love is sin-hating. Sin-rejecting. 1 Corinthians 13, 6. Now, if you have your Bible there, we're going to read some other scriptures today, too. Though I bestow my goods to feed the poor. Now, that's verse 3. I'm sorry. I can't even see the numbers. What am I doing? All right, number 6. 1 Corinthians 13 and 6. Rejoiceth not in iniquity. Does not rejoice in sinfulness. Has no joy or delight in evil. If you have the real love of God in your life. Paul knew that the Corinthian church, where it came out of, see, we're talking about a church is a body of Christ, ecclesia, called out of darkness into the marvelous light of the gospel. They're called out of sinfulness into righteousness of Christ. Any church, they're called out of following other leaders and following Jesus alone. That's a real church. So in Corinth, you have every kind of evil, every kind of temptation. You, you look around America today and you say, well, that's like America. Well, sure it is. Every sexual immorality, every wickedness, every kind of weakness and failure and foolishness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you know what Brother Paul said? He said, flee fornication. Run from it. Get away from it. Just put it aside. Don't you go there. He's talking about both those in marriage. He's also talking about those outside of marriage also. Don't you get involved in that. 1 Corinthians 11, he talked about gluttons. Anybody here been a glutton for food lately? Did you sit down last night and eat too much food? You better watch it. What about drinking? Drunkards. Paul had them. They were coming into the church. They are coming out of that background. They didn't care about anything. They forgot who they are sometimes. We find that today. Paul is dealing with the Corinthian, uh, the Corinthian Christians who called out to follow Jesus. If you know Jesus in true salvation, he said that means dear ones in Corinth and dear ones in Skyline and Johnson City and anywhere else you may live, those listening by uh, the website. He calls us to repent of sin and turn to Jesus, put trust in Jesus as Savior Lord. So he gives us a renewed mind, a clean, forgiven heart, a transformed lifestyle. You do not, not, say not, Live the same way you used to live. If God has called you out of an old sinfulness, way of life, the old nature of sin, put a new nature in you, how can you still live in the old nature? Yes, we have an old nature within us. I'm saying the old flesh is still with us because we're in this body. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a mind that has not been renewed and changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. When God's Holy Spirit gets hold of you and changes you to come to Jesus, He puts a new mind, a new heart, and a new life in you. Amen? If any man be in Christ, he is an old creation? No, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You write it down and read it. It makes you new. All things have passed away. They might not pass away in the same night. They might not pass away the next week, but they will pass away. You will not live continually that way again. <clears throat> Love takes no pleasure in the reports of failure 
on the part of others or the wickedness they are doing. We don't need to be caught if we really love people and try to help them. Caught in destructive gossip, that's another word for slander. Christians should never rejoice in the sin of someone else, especially another Christian. Believers are to be anxious to correct sin. Now listen carefully, real careful. A lot of people, even in churches, well, if you love everybody, why do you exercise church discipline? Well, that's because we don't exercise church discipline. That's what's happened in the life of many churches today. They haven't done what Jesus said. And I'll show you in a minute. See, loving people is hating sinfulness. Let's look in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And you can hold your place there in 1 Corinthians 13, but let's turn over a few letters. His letter to the church in Thessalonica, this is second letter or second epistle. It talks a lot about the return of Jesus in this great uh, few chapters. But anyway, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, the last chapter of the little Second letter. Watch what he says. Speaking to the church. And the Lord, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 5, And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. This Lord directing your hearts in love, he wants the church to be characterized by the real love of Jesus in their heart. Verse 6, here's where you put love into action. Now we command you, brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. So what is he trying to tell the church there? It's an act of discipline. Verse 14. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle letter, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. He's living outside of the disciplines of the church and the word of God. Put him aside. Verse 15, count him, watch it, it's a very important statement here now. Count him not as an enemy, but admonishing him as a brother. You like to, we don't use that word enough today in the church or in daily life. That's an old English word. To admonish something is to warn. W A R N, say W A R N. You ever warned anybody about something? You tell your children. Say if you've got a 20-year-old child. You can't go take something from them because they're maybe already out of the home, for example. They're on their own, making their own living. But you can surely say to them, son, daughter, I'm telling you something out of great love for your own life. I warn you. See? That's the word admonish. You're not hating them. You are not against them. You love them enough to say, I want to warn you what can take place. Do you see the picture? The same in the church. And I know some people here who've gone aside others. They told me before. They went to some of our people, backslidden, inactive, gone off the charts, for example, and said to them, I warn you, you are going in the wrong direction. I say, well, bless God. I can preach it, and I can tell it sometimes, but I can't tell it to all people. That's real love. Somebody say, oh, no, you're, you're, uh, you're judging somebody. No, you, you get the wrong picture. Don't buy the, the idea of this world system. We are not living under the government kingdom. We are under the Lord's kingdom. The kingdom of God. 
We are a spiritual kingdom, not political, physical kingdom. Brother Paul, if a believer persists in sin, will not turn from it, you to put him out of the church. Cut him off from fellowship. Don't have anything to do with him. Doesn't mean you forget about him. You said, listen, I'm warning you, I'm trying to help you. This is time to wake up. See, it's part of showing the love of God, the true love, real love of God to control your life. Since love hates sin, it goes to the sinner and says, this isn't right. Love purifies the fellowship. It removes sin that would stain the rest of the people. Why do you think today in the life of the church, right at Skyline Heights, go down the membership roll, those who have membership roles, go down that membership roll, and because the church is not disciplined, numbers of them, they have affected other people throughout the church. Do you know that? Somebody says your church disciplines. Well, I can tell you. I'm going to tell you what Jesus said. Are you ready? Turn in your Bible to Matthew 18. Very important. Jesus is talking about the love of forgiveness. You'll know it when you hear it. It's a great passage. The whole chapter is a great, great passage. Matthew 18, watch this, 15 through 17. Are you ready? Matthew 18, 15 to 17. Here we go. Moreover, if thy brother, that brother means a brother in Christ, sister in Christ, a Christian, fellow Christian, shall trespass against you, go and tell him his fault between who? These, you, and him alone. You and her alone, say for two ladies. If he shall hear you, thou hast gained thy brother. 16, but if he will not hear thee, then take with thee what? How many? One or two. That in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. You see, you've got to have the backup. You've got to have somebody to prove. You're saying, here's a brother. Here are two sisters with me in Christ. We love you. But this is what's taking place. And if you don't change, if you don't get it right, if you're not forgiven, if you don't show true love, what's going to happen next? Verse 17. Now, if you're writing something down in your Bibles, you ought to put church discipline up on the top. I don't have it put on top of mine, but it has sin and forgiveness up here at the top. Verse 17. If he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto whom? The whole church, whole church body, church family. But if he neglect to hear the church, if he, won't, if he won't get right, take the warning, the admonishment of the church, let him be the, to thee as a heathen man and a publican. You put him outside. Until he's willing to repent. Or she, you welcome them back with open arms. Now, that's the guidelines of Jesus, not Paige's guideline. I'm just presenting it. So don't think that's less than loving. It is loving. It's real love of the church and the Christian brothers and sisters. Real love doesn't tolerate evil. Love doesn't smile and laugh. I'm telling you what. We had a government official this past week. I saw it. They started laughing about a very serious matter. And I thought I was doing this right here. Love, real love, doesn't smile and laugh at sin. Now, Sin is an affront to God. It brings punishment on the sinner. So what we've got to do is pray and admonish. Warn. Show the people. They need to confess. 
and have true repentance. True repentance is, is sorrow in your heart. You know, you've done something wrong against the Lord and against someone else. You're broken about it. You, you want to get it right. You turn away from it. Turn to Jesus. And then you can be restored. That's real love right there. So, real love is what? Sin hating. Sin rejecting. 15. Number 15. Real love is truth loving. Truth loving. Joy is in the truth. Rejoice is in the truth. That's back in 1 Corinthians 13, the second part of verse 6. You can see it there. Old King James says, but rejoiceth in the truth. It has joy in the truth. Now, go back to a second letter again. Second letter, John. Second letter, John. That's way back, close to Revelation. You got first, second, and third John. Those are the letters. Then you have Jude and Revelation. All right. Second John. It has 13 verses. Just look at verse 6. And this is love that we walk after his commandments. Say walk after his commandments. This is a commandment that as you've heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not. They say not. Jesus Christ is not come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Now, think about this. When you mention the word love, but people, it's called eros, the thoughts of romantic love. It's feeling, feeling good. And nothing wrong about that. Warm attitudes. The deeper thing is found right here in second letter of John. I'm telling you, church, Brother John's saying, I'm telling you, church, this is love. You walk where? You live where? You obey what? His commandments. You walk according to his commandments. You want to obey the truth of the word of God. Love cannot rejoice with error, false teaching. See, in verse 7, John had it. The second letter right there still, seeing that little letter. In verse 7, he said, many deceivers. They're liars. They confess Jesus hasn't come in the flesh. What they're saying is the incarnation didn't take place. God didn't become a man in Jesus. Brother John says, I'll tell you what, John 1, 14, and the word was made what? Flesh. Came from heaven as a human. Divine became man. God became man in the person of Jesus. Incarnation, born of the Virgin Mary in the manger of Bethlehem. True love has no joy in deceit, foolishness. Mother said about her son that time, I always remember that. I said, how's your son doing? I knew him. He had moved to another city somewhere way back at the end of high school. And I saw the mother and I asked about him. I said, how's he doing? Oh, he's doing well. I said, he's having a church home. Oh, yeah, he's, he's in a certain denomination or religion. He said, she said, you know what? Just as long as he is somewhere, just as long as he has some religion. I said, no, ma'am. That is not a true statement. I could have all kinds of religion. All kinds of gods. And then she said something else. We're all going to the same place. I said, is that, you're sure about that? I wanted to ask her what kind of Bible she's reading. 
She's supposed to have read the Bible and know about Jesus, but apparently she didn't. Don't you buy that lie of the world? It's right straight from the pits of hell. It has smoke coming out of it. Everybody, if everybody is going to the same place, well, why did Jesus die on the cross? Why did he raise himself from the dead again, send to heaven, now he's coming back to take out his church and then come back and set up his kingdom in a new heavens and new earth? Why is he going to do that? If everybody is going to the same place. Oh, you know that's error. It's false. It's just plain untrue. I cannot have joy with false teaching. That's real love. Religion or relationship. I've always said religion is man trying to get his way to God. However way he wants to. His own selfish way. That's religion. Relationship with the true God through his son Jesus Christ is God coming to us. Coming down here in the person of Jesus to die for us. Take care of our sin problem. Put his righteousness in us so that we can stand before the judgment of God and say you're free. Come on in to the glorious heaven I have prepared for you. It's faith in Jesus Christ. Repentance of sin and faith in the Lord Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus said, John 14, 6. If I were to stand before television right now and go before television, local news, all these NBCs, ABCs, all the regular news people, and I were to stand here and they had the cameras on me, I would say, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no person, no woman, no one can go to heaven but through the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I'd say that, first word one says, that is intolerant. You cannot say that. Then the next one would say this. That's being exclusive. You can't exclude other people from what you believe. That's what you believe. And then the next one would say, the next television, you are very narrow-minded. And I look at every one of the newscasts, news anchors. I said, now you go tell them, dear ones. It's not what Don Page said. It's what Jesus Christ himself said, and you deal with him. Is that not true? True love teaches. It does matter what you believe. Don't forget that. The very greatest thing in your life, I've told you that before, as you deal with your children and then with your grandchildren, you better help them understand the basics of the true foundation of faith in Jesus. If they do not believe that, they do not get the foundation. They're already done. And when they step outside your home, wherever you go, wherever they go, they will not stand. They won't have a prayer hardly to stand upon unless by the grace of God he does some miracle in their life. Not only is what you believe, it's also your behavior, how you live. These folks say, well, I believe in Jesus, Pastor. I trusted Jesus as my Savior when I was seven years old. And now he's 20 years old and living for the devil. But he could say to me at seven years old, I really believe in Jesus, but I behave like the devil. True or false? Is that a real Christian or not? Is that a real follower of Jesus? When he stands before Jesus, if Jesus came to that boy and stood before him right now, 20 years old, said, hey, Jesus, I trust you when I was seven years old. I said, yeah, I remember something about that young fella. He said, I want to know who you're trusting now. You mean to tell me that I'm not the same Jesus at seven as you are at 20? Or you can be 20 years old, come to Jesus. Then you get 40, we say, I've got to start a new life now. I'm leaving Jesus behind. 
Oh, the church, they, they, my daddy and mama made me go to church when I was young. I'm so sick of hearing that through my lifetime. I say, please don't tell me that. It has nothing to do from 20 years ago because your mom and daddy made you go to a church house to hear a preacher. You cannot live 20 years ago and you're 40 now. You're not 20 anymore. Behave and believe. It goes together. The other side of the meaning of rejoice in truth, Jesus loved and encouraged what was right and good in others. He saw greater possibilities as he rejoiced in the truth. You know about Simon Peter and Andrew, James and John. You know what they were, don't you? They were all struggling, tough, and rough fishermen. And they came to Jesus. What about the, he marveled at the Roman centurion's faith? Oh, didn't Jesus rejoice in him? Remember the centurion said, hey, Jesus, I appreciate you come and take care of my servant. That's, he's just a great servant. This is a Roman pagan, a leader of a hundred soldiers. Sure, he heard of Jesus. Spirit of God, the Heavenly Father, through His marvelous grace, put it down in that centurion's heart. Look to Jesus. Go to Jesus. Show your love for Jesus. And he said, Jesus, I'm not even worthy that you come and step into my house. I just believe it. You say the word. You say the word, and I believe it. That's great faith, Jesus said. No one greater in Israel has said that. What about the queen of harlotry? Your name was? Once known as a prostitute. Mary Magdalene from Magdala. That's where you get Mary Magdalene. Jesus changed her, and she was greatly forgiven. She humbled herself before Jesus. Jesus says, you need to seek what's right and best. If you're going to show real love in your life and rejoice in the truth, you be a truth lover. Don't you buy that false teachings, the false lies of this world system. I am head of a new kingdom, Jesus says. You're going to follow me. You do not follow the ways of the world. Yes, you're living in the world. That's why I put you there. But you're not to live of the world and to be trapped by the world. You're to love me with all your heart and you're to follow me with all your soul. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this great time we shared together today. I pray the Holy Spirit will just keep putting in us the picture, the meaning of real love. And I pray today if there's someone who needs that real love of Jesus, this Lord Jesus left heaven's glory, perfect Lamb of God left heaven's glory, come to this earth to die that cruel death for us, took in, taking our place at the cross, shedding blood that we could be forgiven, not what any animal sacrificed, not what any person, not what any righteousness I could do myself. Only what Jesus has done. I rest my case. I trust him as my Savior, Lord. And I want to live for him and follow after him. God, give us that love for Jesus. Then if someone here today needs to come into your church, you help them to do that, to be a part of the family of God, this body of Christ in this place. And Lord, today, others may need prayer. Just draw them close to you by your Holy Spirit. We ask in the wondrous name of Jesus, amen and amen.